Hello everyone, my name is Elias Martin of CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Welcome to my latest seminar. It's titled Smoldering Plumes and Glowing Embers, Japanese Prints During and After World War II. Uh, today's presentation will feature an assortment of woodblock prints by both Shinhanga and Sosaku Hanga artists. And before we get into the, uh, the uh, the seminar. I just want to uh, introduce myself in the program. A lot of people now have started watching through uh, YouTube and I upload these videos after they're completed um, onto YouTube. Of course, I prefer a live um, audience because at the end of these seminars, I invite all of you to chime in and to uh, encourage questions. So obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, maybe a year or two later, you can't do that. But at the same time, I, I would like to encourage par participation, even with those watching this at a later date. Feel free to leave a comment or a question below in the, in the, in the comment section. And regardless of whether this is it's five years from now, I will answer your question. In fact, I'd love to engage um, all of those interested in this topic um, as long as these videos are up. And so, um, you know, dare I say that, maybe I'll be 80 years old um, answering questions, but that'd be, I, I, I think that would be great. So, but anyway, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Elias Martin. As I said, I, I own and operate a Japanese woodblock print and painting gallery. I'm based in Chicago, and uh, my website is called Collecting Japanese Prints. The site is dedicated to collectors. I mean, I offer the, the best um, prints available on the market, whether it's ukiyo-e, shinhanga, sosaku-hanga, or contemporary. I also offer paintings, and I have a very handy and helpful bookstore to collectors. So if you want to learn more about what we'll discuss today, there are plenty of books in my bookstore that can help with that. And so now let's sort of consider a little bit about um, Japanese prints um, produced during the war. And before we can do that, I, I want to talk about the the two movements that, it, that sort of experienced this part of um, history in Japan. And we're, what we're talking about are Shinhanga and Sosakuhanga. And those are two very distinct movements in Japanese print history. Shinhanga prints were a continuation of the Edo period tradition of printmaking. It was a collaborative process um, run by the publisher. So the publisher basically started an enterprise of making prints. Um, it was strictly commercial. And he just would decide, okay, well, you know, we'll make some prints of Mount Fuji or some prints of, of a temple or this or that. And he would hire an artist to produce the, the design. And he, of course, had a stable of artisans that would uh, carve the blocks and print the prints. So it was a collaborative process. It was the same process that occurred in Japan um, for hundreds of years. I mean, they were making prints in Japan in the 1600s. And so this was the same process. It was strictly commercial. But there was another movement, Sosaku Hanga, and that was a creative print movement, uh, which um, basically was inspired by Western ideas of, of, of art. Um, art was actually not a, a Japanese idea. So an artist or fine art, as we understand it, was not really something that was um, sort of understood or even even sought after. It, the art that we that they produced, they would they saw themselves more as artisans, and there was a less of a focus on the individual. So with Sosaku Hanka artists, they were very interested in using traditional techniques and materials that were ing indigenous to Japan, to their culture, but using them in a way to be able to express themselves and, and join in a conversation an artistic conversation that was ongoing throughout the world. 
So it wasn't a localized idea. It was, you know, these Sosakuhanga artists were reading Western magazines and consuming um, literature and, and images that were being imported into Japan that were from the West. They were looking at Cubism and, and Impressionism and, and all of the isms, really. And they were coming in all at the same time at the beginning of the of the uh, 20th century. So these artists really were inspired by all these things and started creating their own prints. And, and so the, the emphasis um, uh, for this movement, so Sakuhanga was on the individual and on the individual's experience uh, that, that he or she was, you know, uh, experiencing um, through life. And so the, these, these prints that they produced really speak to these individual artists and their place in history. Um, and of course, there was these large historical things happening and they were, of course, responding to it. And so I want to highlight how both traditions, Shinhanga and Sosakuhanga, participated in this conversation about the war, right before the war, and then afterwards. And what happened? Um, how did the war transform those two traditions? So that's what I hope to do today. Um, we will. Look, I have a lot of artwork to, to go through. And these lectures usually last a little bit longer than an hour, but I don't end them. You know, I'll, I'll finish them when they finish. I'll be mindful of your time, of course. And if you have to um, go away and come back, I encourage you to watch the video when I upload it onto YouTube. And of course, I welcome questions. So if you have questions, write them down. And at the end of, the, uh, of our um, conversation, we will certainly discuss them, okay? So I want to thank all of you for joining me. I see several of you online. Thank you. So let's uh, look at some artwork. So um, I put on the table an assortment of, of, of things to talk about first. Um, but what I'll do is I'll talk about this Hasui. And um, this Hasui is a print that I discussed in my Woodblock Wednesday. Um, and for those of you who have not seen Woodblock Wednesday, every Wednesday uh, we, you know, we get together for about a half hour um, at uh, 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we talk about prints and paintings. And this print, I went in at length about it. And so I don't want to talk too much about it. So if, you're, if you want to learn more about it, I encourage you to go to my Woodblock Wednesday series. It's on my website, uh, collectingjapaneseprints.com, and click on it and you know watch it. But for our purposes um, of this conversation today, it is important to highlight because, first of all, Shinhanga artists... Um, were hired to produce images, of course. And so this design, or the idea of this design, was conceived by the, the nephew of Watanabe, and he was the publisher. And Watanabe was basically the founder of Shinhanga. He, he basically continued the tradition, as I mentioned, of the Edo period tradition of woodblock printmaking. And this print was done in 1937. And that's an important date because 1937 represents uh, an important um, place in history. It was the year that Japan invaded China and invaded Manchuria, and it started an occupation that lasted until the end of the war. And this print represents a tradition of war images um, that the Japanese were very fond of, particularly in the Meiji period. And, you know, and what I've done is, actually, a, there's a book here that I highly recommend. It's, it's called Conflicts of Interest, Art and War in Modern Japan. The, the two curators of this exhibition um, did a phenomenal job at writing this book. And, and I, obviously, the exhibition is um, over. It was at St. Louis Art Museum. And, um, but the book um, is a great memento of the exhibition, and there's some great scholarship done. And, you know, this book showcases um, the tradition of woodblock printmaking that highlights war designs. And we, that, that could be a lecture, <laughs> um, a series, in fact, of lectures onto itself. But I want to point out that Hasui is drawing upon the Meiji period tradition of war triptychs or war designs 
And this particular design was done by Kyochika. And Kyochika was a, a multifaceted artist. He specialized in kabuki prints as well as these war triptychs. And he brought his his fascination in, in for the for the theater, the Kabuki theater, and he created created a lot of drama in um, in his designs. And of course, the war, you know, is perfect. You know, scenes of war, you know, is perfect um, marriage to bring drama um, into these designs. And so he did that. And so in this design, just quickly, he he incorporated, of course, the the red of fires um, billowing behind the the sort of the gates to a city and then there, there's you see that the the, the fighters or the, the soldiers are fighting in silhouettes and their silhouettes are reflected into the water very dramatic you know so anyway i wanted to point out that there is a rich tradition of war images in japanese art history however during the meiji period that interest sort of waned and, you know, J Japan was in conflicts with Russia and China, and those, those war um, designs depicted those conflicts. But as the 20th century emerged, interest in these, these war designs, again, as I said, waned, and, and, and the sales of these prints decreased as time went on. And so Watanabe was kind of hesitant to produce this design. And in fact, Hasui created four designs um, of this uh, of this sort of uh, motif. They're all different, but at the same time, they're all about the war, and um, they didn't sell well. And 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 the, one of the reasons I, we we know this as co collectors, connoisseurs, and dealers is they're just not available. You don't see them that often, and in the the Japanese public, I, I think didn't really buy them. They weren't all that interested in images like this exactly perhaps it reminded them too much of the meiji period triptychs i don't know um but the sentiment for this particular print wasn't too strong and i think it was very romanticized this image the the, the silhouette of the soldiers have it, it has this very strong um poetic um quality to it that I don't know, maybe it, it just didn't connect with the viewers buying prints. And I have to mention that for Watanabe, a major portion of his his uh, his collect his body of of, of um, buyers were Westerners, so they wouldn't be buying these prints anyway. So this was really meant for domestic consumption, and as far as we can tell, it was not a hit. So I wanted to start there. Um, but I, you know, and, and I want to highlight here, I'm going to come in so you could look at the print um, for a moment. I'm, so I'm trying to do all of this with my phone, with one hand, and move some prints around. So as I said, this is 1937. And I wanted to highlight this print and begin it with this, this print because this really epitomizes a movement, or not a period, I mean, in, in Japanese um, history and culture and even in art and so at this time um, the people have historians have called this the the dark valley or in Japanese uh, kurai tanima and and it's basically uh, the idea is it's a dark valley valley in between the earlier period of liberalism that was found in the Taisho era. So imagine those prints of mogas and, and the flapper dancers and the, the martini glasses of the Taisho era. Well, the, imagine that as a, a, at one peak, and then the other peak is the democracy that was brought to Japan after the war. In between then, there, there's this sort of what they've coined is this dark valley. And so there, there are images that were produced during this period. And it's basically, um, you know, late 20s into the, in, into up until the war. And I want to highlight some very rare designs that actually predate this 1937 design. And then we can get into a conversation, a very quick conversation about this Dark Valley period, because that leads us right into prints produced during the war. So, I want to highlight this book. It's a really interesting book. It was produced by 
uh, by a publisher that created books for elementary schools. This book was done in 1928, and the cover was des designed by um, Senpan, Mayakawa Senpan. And Senpan, um, for those of, who, of you who are familiar with Sosaku Hanga artists, he, he was a, a very fine Sosaku Hanga artist, produced a lot of prints, um, self-published um, most of his body of work, but this was something that was published by a publisher. He was also a cartoonist, a commercial cartoonist, and so he was hired to produce designs, and in this case, this, this really striking um, cover of this book. Now, this has, this, this has all of the, the bells and whistles of what you would look for in the, the Taisho area of, you know, skyscrapers and, and, and airplanes flying overhead and lights. But it also starts pointing to Japan's interest in building up its military. And so in this book, um, I highlighted a couple pages. You know, if I could show, if I can move my hand around, sorry, for that extreme close-up. So we have, you know, some, some images of these planes and, these wa and this watercraft. And this book is dedicated to airplanes and submarines, um, believe it or not. And this, as I said, is for elementary school students. And here we have two soldiers. Um, you know, they're all dressed in their finest military regalia, looking over very um, heroic, heroically over a flying plane overhead. And so, and then there's these kids looking and pointing to the plane. And so the images in this book really start connecting to this idea of Japan building its military and its technological advancements in, 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 in these areas that could be used for war. And, you know, they were interested, Japan was really interested in expanding its empire. And so the, the, these books served to cultivate interest in children in this type of technology. So, you know, I find it very fascinating. And then, of course, there's some images of the emperor and, and other, um, other people who are important and some black and white um, images of other craft um, and then some, some really early submarines. So the, the book is a really interesting um, example of this, this sentiment that was already um, occurring in the mid to late 20s. And since this book was used for elementary school students, we, we know that the, the government was very interested in fostering these, these, you know, these feelings of, of pride in Japan's advancements with uh, technology. Now, the next group of prints I want to show, um, um, these are really interesting postcards. Um, and they are dated 1928. Um, and the, there's a stamp that says Osaka. So the, these show or they commemorate the, the tests that were done in 1928 for a uh, missile defense system against uh, planes. Uh, and, and so the, 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 what we have here is, look at this plane. It looks exactly like the Sempan book. And so we could, we could also date it by, by that because the, the planes certainly changed. The, the, Japan advanced technologically quite quickly. And in, in fact, they had a superior air force in some ways than the Allied forces. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But, I mean, you could see this, this airplane dropping these bombs. And then you see the billowing clouds with the fire. There's the bomb there. And then, of course, there's the, this is the, um, the beam of light that's being casted up trying to find these planes. And here are the gunners um, looking for the planes. So, you know, imagine here, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move this so it could be more literal. But imagine, you know, what, what they're seeing. The gunners are looking for these planes. It's night or evening. They could barely see them. And, and then they're shooting up. And of course, uh, this is also a, a huge um, uh, piece of machinery of artillery that obviously shoots out things, missiles out of, out of that. And so I want to also highlight the stamp, which I think is really fascinating. Here are the gunners sh um, shooting these big missiles, and then you see the, the, the 
of the planes overhead, and then you have a figure there in a gas mask. So these gas masks look really <laughs> frightening, um, and you know, you know, but that's what they had to to use at the time. So I wanted to highlight these these three postcards. They they were you know I, I I'm sure they were purchased to support the the efforts being made by the uh, the government but these were never sent which i'm not surprised they they have the postage and they're stamped ready to go but they were never sent and so these are wonderful that they survived and we have a memory of what was happening and these of course are quite rare because they were done before the war and and we can date that also based on this airplane just like the senpan book so the, the next work I want to talk about is this, uh, this Sosaku Hanka magazine. Here, let me just move over some things so I could prep. And, and basically, the, the Sosaku Hanka magazine is called Shiro Tokuro. And the, 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 the magazine was produced um, in 1931. So this is certainly done at the time of the Dark Valley. And normally, this art magazine highlighted some really forward-thinking designs by various artists, including Ono Tadashige and Taninaka Yasunori. Um, Taninaka, we'll, we'll talk about him um, um, later, but he was a big figure in this magazine. And um, the magazine is an example of one of the publications that Sosaku, the Sosaku Hanga movement uh, was producing at the time. Um, and one of the things I want to say is that unlike the Shinhanga movement that was funded entirely by a publisher who was very interested in producing commercially viable designs, the Sosaku Hanga artists really didn't have a market, um, at least at this time, for their artwork. And so a large portion of the movement sustained itself through these magazines. Um, and, and so there are all kinds of doujin magazines from, from they start from the very beginning, from 1904. Um, that's at the beginning of the movement and they continue through up until after the war. Um, I, I think they died down by the 60s, but they, you know, there's some examples of, of some that I can think of in the 60s, but those are anomalies. The, the, the 30s were a particularly ripe time for these magazines. And so... This one, again, the unifying factor of, of, this, of this magazine is that most of the de designs were done in black and white. But in this particular issue, um, and I, as I said, 1931 is when it was produced, there are, is there are designs of soldiers and the war. And so at this point in time, Japan had not yet invaded um, China. But if we look carefully at these images, we kind of see... That, that, that a lot of these images anticipate um, the occupation. So I won't go through all of them, and I'll go through them kind of quickly because there's so much to see. But here we have an armored vehicle. This is a curious print. It's by Senpan, same artist that produced that um, book cover, which is fantastic. And it's a, it's a man with a cage, which I have to really think about what that might mean in the context of, of this book. But quickly... Here is a design by Hatsuyama, who was a children's book illustrator. And this is an armored um, train brigade that was carrying military supplies. It's fascinating. Um, and, you know, he was, he was known mostly as a children's book illustrator, but he did contribute um, to this. So then we have here a really brightly colored um, design of a soldier looking through... Um, a, a, a gateway into the city. Then we have these two soldiers sitting here. Now we have a, a, a very modern looking bridge with soldiers um, looking out on both sides. You know, and, I, and, we, and it's interesting because like, like I said, the, Japan was not yet engaged in conflict with China. So this is all sort of, in, it, it's meant to, I think in some ways, to sort of show those who were interested in buying this magazine that Japan 
was a force to be reckoned with. And, and, um, and it was really a lot of saber rattling, if you ask me. And so at the same time, they did follow through, um, and, and, and that, that conflict with China lasted, as I said, until the war ended. But I'll just quickly move through these. They're vi- some of them are more representational. Others are a little bit more um, cartoonish. And, and om- I, none of them are abstract, but th- they tend to move towards that. Um, and then if you look at these figures, this, is, this figure looks Chinese, you know, and, and, and so there's, and I'll point out one more that is almost in some ways very disturbing. Um, we have soldiers, again, in a black and white, very, um, th- this, this style is social realistic. This style was actually in, um, imported into China. I mean, into Japan through China, um, a lot of artists um, in the Soviet Union and in, in China were producing s- social realistic images. And of course, you know, the Japanese uh, caught on and used that style for their own purposes. This looks like the armored vehicle that we just saw at the very beginning. Some more soldiers over a tower. There's a, kind of like a sketch um, but w- one of the, the designs I want to talk about quickly is this this print that's on the back of the it's a back cover of this book, and you know it smacks as something very racist, and and this r- looks to my eye as like those images that were produced by Kyochika in the Meiji period depicting the Chinese, um, and so you know this. This book being produced before the, the, the conflict with China is interesting because it really shows the historical um, sort of atmosphere uh, of Japan um, and how they were getting... Uh, um, oh, Th- Hollis, thank you for your comment. So Japan first invaded Manchuria in 1931. Thank you for that, yes. And, and so this then reflects that. And I was more or less thinking about the... the, the 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 issue in 1937 so fantastic so we can connect this then to to that invasion thank you for that hollis i appreciate that and hollis goodall is the curator for uh lacma so thank you very much for joining me so the 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 next work i want to talk about is a another sosaku hanga magazine Um, this is actually one that was published in 1941 and it was published by a publisher. So a lot of the prints were, it, it, for, from this movement were self-driven, self-produced. But in this case, um, this Kawanishi design, and, and Kawanishi was a very, very important Sosaku Hanga artist, produced the vast majority of his artwork was self-published. Um, he, he was actually, um, professionally, he was, um, he was a, a postal service employee. And, you know, he, he, he was an artist uh, by night. And at this time, you know, he was producing designs to sell, um, but it wasn't his ma- main source of livelihood. But in this case, he was hired by a publisher, and this book belongs to a group of books, um, which includes a, pr- uh, a book by Onchi, by Sekino, uh, by Sumio Kawakami, um, Kawanishi, as I said, and others, uh, Takeo Take and others. And this particular book, um, I want to thank Bill and Roberta Stein, uh, that comes from their personal collection. Uh, and, um, and so the book, you know, it's a charming kind of Kawanishi style book. For those of you who, who, who've seen Kawanishi's work here, here's the date, 1941. You know, there, there's all these, um, interesting sort of typical, Kawanishi designs, uh, there's his room, brightly colored. This is so typical of, of the artist. But then we start seeing some interesting images. And so in this case, we, we see, in uh, all of these, the, the, the book is, is showcasing basically harbor scenes. And so the, the room that we just saw was in a room that was near a harbor. <laughs> and I think that's the unifying um, theme to the book. 
But I want to highlight two designs. And so the, this is really interesting design where all of these ships with uh, the Japanese flag. This looks very nationalistic, um, 1941, um, very much engaged in the conversation of Japan's um, uh, superiority as they, they saw it for their naval um, forces and and this really was getting people excited about you know what what Japan had and um, you know to move along I, I just kind of want to show other images these are um, sailors walking by uh, rooms with nautical themed objects a port uh, this is a very lively scene with a it looks like these are um, Officers uh, playing music, probably some very um, nationalistic music with the Japanese flag over overhead. And but I want to move to this design. Now this design is really striking. Um, and oh, Philip, thank you for joining us. I just want to acknowledge Philip. Philip uh, is the curator for for uh, St. Louis Art Museum, the Japanese or eight, all Asian art, and he was the one of the main um, curators for this exhibition and penned this book. So thank you for for joining me. So um, the 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 um, this print really showcases, you know, Japan with with all what they have. Um, in terms of the the navy, you, you, we have the this. We're on a battleship. We see the artillery there with the big, you know, um, I don't even know what to call this with with just with with the artillery, and then the, the, we have the Japanese battle flag, and I think that's significant. You don't often see uh, this flag in prints, um, and it's a very controversial thing. In some ways, now. It's seen almost like the Confederate flag for, for some of us in the United States. It brings back really bad memories. And for some of the Japanese, the battle flag represents this time in history where Japan was so militant and interested in, in a military expansion. Um, and, and, of course, it brings up what the consequences of all of that but others see it as nationalistic, and there is a nationalistic movement in Japan, even currently. So it's small, but it's still there. And so what we, you know, just, I just want to highlight again, look at these planes flying overhead in formation, and then there's a, the naval fleet out in force, and, and it's just a riot of color. Though, it's only what we see is primary colors, you know, the red, white, blue, some black, but it is so loud and it's so Kawanishi and it, it's a striking design. And, and this book in particular is one that I think of when, when, when we think of this period, this nationalistic um, sort of dark valley period. So I just wanted to highlight this, uh, this book. So um, now I've shown some, some Sosaku Hanga prints. Now these were, these aren't really Sosaku Hanga and I don't, I don't know who produced these. They're not signed. They could have easily been uh, by Sosaku Hanga artist, but the style is more representative, more Shinhanga-esque, though Senpon was the artist who produced that book, and it's very representational, but he was... And I don't, he didn't produce abstract designs, really, but it is more in line with Shinhanga in terms of style-wise. But I want to show an example that is more subtle, you know, we were talking about Kawanishi and the battle flag. And the, the Shinhanga artists had to tread very carefully because in some ways their prints were being sold out west. Even though the market for Japanese, Japanese prints decreased substantially because of the war, the, this, this design was done in 1937. And or 39, I, I forget. I have to look it up. It's on my website. It's by Kuetsu. He's a Shinhanga artist, and it showcases a scene in Nikko. And Nikko um, is a shrine dedicated to the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, and so it was the Tokugawa family that controlled Japan for a couple hundred years. And so this design... Um, is representational and very charming and beautiful, 
beautiful design. And to an untrained eye, a Westerner, it, they would just see an idyllic scene in Japan. And it's certainly that. But there's also an undercurrent of sort of a nationalistic quality to it if you're looking at it in another way. And for the Japanese at the time, these historical places um, that connected their history to power, particularly the, Toku, the Tokugawa uh, uh, family, and the, the shogun, you know, controlled Japan for hundreds of years. So, and they d- defended themselves from outside uh, forces. And so this also conjured up nationalistic feelings in feelings of we can do this, we, we, we have always protected ourselves, we, we can do this kind of thing. And so, you know, I wanted to highlight that. Now, this is not something that is obvious, but in this context, um, being produced at this time in the late 30s, y- y- you could see this, you know, um, and, and you could certainly see the conversation for those who have eyes to see. Um, in this in, in this particular context, oh, the, uh, well, hello everyone. Thanks uh, for holding on. I was uh, buffering there. Uh, you know, I have Wi-Fi here, but the it was uh, acting up. So uh, I hope I didn't lose too many of you. I'm back, um, and we were talking about this, Nico. Um, scene and the the Tokugawa shogunate as something as part of this nationalistic um, conversation that was occurring in the late 30s. So now there's still a lot to see. You know, these were just in some ways my introduction. And so I want to, you know, bring out some some important pieces to discuss. So let me see if I could do this with Excuse my extreme close-ups. So um, I want to highlight some artists that I think were being a bit subversive. And this artist, Ishii, um, he, wrote, he was a Sosaku Hanga artist uh, from the early period. Um, he was very active from... Um, well, he was a, a good friend with Yamamoto Kanai, and so he was working in the early 20s through the 30s onto the, up, up until the years of the war. And in this design, this was done in 1931, we have a figure who is a swimmer that's sort of just barely keeping up. I mean, his head's just above the water. And um, a lot of people have commented on this design, meaning that, that this design might be a commentary to the sort of military or, or control of culture or maybe the nationalistic quality that was uh, occurring in, in, in culture. And, you know, these Japanese print artists were participating in ex- small exhibitions. And some of those exhibitions, most of them were, were sort of sponsored by the government. And things, not that the government told them what to do in many cases. The government certainly sponsored trips. Um, the government paid Yoshida, Hiroshi Yoshida, to travel to Manchuria, that it also paid Koshiro, Onchi Koshiro, um, one of the main figures of the Sosaku Hanga movement, to go to Manchuria and, and, and produce art. And they both produced art in, in very different ways, and we could talk about that in a little bit. But Ishii, in this design, I do see um, a kind of subversive quality in this design commenting on to about the political and artistic climate that was occurring um you know and for this is 1931 um and basically it's the same period of time when that album of 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 prints were produced he probably didn't take too fondly over those images so not all of the artists were interested in producing sort of these patriotic nationalistic images. But I have to say that both Shin Hanka and Sosaku Hanka artists did participate in such a thing. Uh, and I, I think there's a sort of a, a, a cleanup 
um, that either art historians or even the, the Japanese artists and, and, and uh, themselves they never really truly wanted to acknowledge maybe their involvement with support of the war. They were all Japanese, of course, and, and it's hard for me to believe that they weren't at the very least supportive of, of their country in some way. And so, you know, I wanted to highlight both Sosaku Hanga and Shin Hanga artists doing designs sort of in support of the war effort in many ways. But at the end of the war, the, the, the direction that both of those movements, movements take is very different. And that we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But to keep in line with the, the sort of subversive view of what was happening at the time, here we have a print by Tani Naka Yasunori. And I'm including a print here. This is his self-portrait. Now, this has nothing to do with the war, but I just think it's a charming print, and we get to see the artist here. Um, he's singing a song. It was probably opera, uh, and he's sort of lip-singing, or maybe really singing, uh, and there is the record player there next to him. But uh, in this design, this is, this is a print that was done in the early 30s. I th believe this is 1931-32, and so this dates to the period of, the, of this, this, uh, this magazine, and he was involved with that magazine, but he did not contribute a design in that particular book, which I find fascinating. And in this print, we have an airplane. Well, you know, it is an airplane, but it's also more than that. It's this big bird that has the, these, um, these propellers, and basically it's an airplane, and, and it's, it's causing dread. You could see all these people cowering and just like looking up with such fear. You can see this guy right here in the center. He almost looks like Edward Munch's The Scream figure right in the center. And this, this print is really sort of a, a um, I, I'd say it's definitely polemic. It's a commentary at, about what was happening in, 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 the, in the culture of, of, of printmaking, particularly in his world. And maybe he was fearful of what was coming. This certainly anticipates the, the bombings of Tokyo. And I want to say something about that. Um, we'll talk about the bombings of Tokyo in a bit. But since we're on him, him in particular, um, Tani Naka Yasunori lost his home in the bombing and he 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 was basically living out of a shelter that he was able to make out of the scraps from his home and he had a small pumpkin patch in the backyard and he was surviving on the pumpkin patch and Onchi one of the leaders of the Sosaku Hanga movement would ask him how are you doing and he his response was Mr. Pumpkin is treating me well and he was such an, a character. He was, almost, he was basically a surrealist. And, you know, and so what happened is tragic. He, he died of malnutrition. You know, and he was such a visionary. His artwork was so powerful. You know, I'll show one more print of his. Um, and this one is also kind of dark. You know, this shows kind of machinery uh, with a skull there. And, and, and so this was done in the, in the thirties, right around this time, 1932. And so the point is, you know, he passed away as a direct consequence of the bombings in Tokyo. And so when we look at this print in that context, this print has such, this design has such potency and meaning, at least for me. And I can't help to see him in, in these, in the faces of each of these individuals. So I want to zoom in on this as well. I mean, as you could see, his work is very um, surrealistic. It's fantastic. It's, it, it, you know, some of them are fun, but some of them are very dark. And so, you know, this sort of highlights the conversation um, that I was having at the time. Now, another artist, uh, the same artist, well, not the same, but we're seeing Kawanishi again. We saw him in that book but in this case this is 19 this print was done in 1940 and you know it's i want to highlight how the same artists can showcase 
prints that are very supportive of the government and at the same time suggest hesitation. In this print, um, yes, uh, Hollis was commenting. Thank you for her comment. She says, yeah, it looks like a machinery of war. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very frightening. It's very much uh, part of that conversation of Japan's sort of rise in, 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 as a military power. And, you know, he's, he's, he's talking about this stuff. But instead of showing it like this, He's showing it in this surrealistic sort of way with maybe a cannonball being shot out. And the machinery is run by this figure that looks like a monkey. You know, the whole thing is wild, but you can't help but to see it as, as a polemic against the, the climate uh, of what was happening. So moving back um, to, to this print, you know, I, I, I see this as an example of how these artists were conflicted. You know, of course, this art, this book is all about the might of the military and Japan's grandeur uh, in, in its military might um, as, a, as a global force. But in, in this print, you know, it's unusual for him. This was done in 1940, and Lawrence Smith, um, who was the curator, he's, he was the keeper of, of Japanese prints at the, the British Museum, wrote about this, this print in one of the, his publications. I think the publication is called Modern Japanese Prints, um, and it's it's a exhibition catalog uh, from the museum's holdings. And in this case, he he talks about how this design is very intro, introverted, and Kawanishi's prints tend to be very loud and and they celebrate life. There there is a there's sort of a, a celebration of of the everyday how cosmopolitan Kobe is, and it's just bright and loud and happy. And, but in this design, the colors are muted, and we have the figure of a, of a woman looking away from the viewer, looking into the garden. And, it, and the garden is Japanese style, obviously. And so I think Smith sort of mentions how this might symbolize Japan contemplating itself and what is happening. Um, on on a global stage, uh, what was happening with Japan, in in the war, you know, I don't know. Maybe maybe you know, uh, uh, it, someone else might say no. It's Lauren Smith trying to clean up um, sort of uh, the tradition of some of these artists participating in the war. I don't know, but I do see his point, and I don't see this design as something that he normally produced. It's 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 much more contemplative. It's much more somber. And so, you know, I wanted to include this print in this conversation because it's sort of the counterbalance to that book. Now, there's one last Kawanishi um, I want to talk about. And this, this design um, is, dates from 1940 again. And... Oh, Philip uh, has mentioned that the woman could be mourning the loss of her husband or loved one or son. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that only certainly adds to that. In, in Japan, you know, we'll talk about this. We talked about Taninaka dying. You know, one million Japanese civilians. It was 1.7 million Japanese died during World War II, if we add up all of the years. But one million died from starvation alone. That that just I I I'd even I don't even understand how I could even comprehend that. I mean I hear that number, but I just don't understand that. And so art send helps us sort of register the the, the trauma of of war in, in in these ways. And so yeah, that's a very subtle way of maybe suggesting a loss. And we'll we'll talk about some re, some images that are really. Um, thought-provoking and, and really go to the heart of war. But in this case, this design um, is done in 1940, and it part, it's part of the tradition of this, uh, of how this koetsu came about. So the, during this time, there was this sort of nationalistic uh, feeling about the, the Japanese landscape. And, um, it, you know, there was this sort of, um, it, it almost seemed like, 
that the artist or even the sentiment was that there was a a a a spirit and an and and sort of a um because in Japan in the Shinto Shinto religion the each of these um important places have a have a kami or a spirit and 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 Fuji is considered a sacred um site for the Shinto religion it, it it is worshipped. There are places where you could go and and pay homage to Fujisan and the the Shin, and the Shinto deities, the kami that inhabit the landscape. And so there is a supernatural sort of quality in these these scenes. Um, I mean, in these in these landscapes. And so there's a. I guess what I want to say is there's a divine nature found in these. Um, places these locales in japan that are also very nationalistic and so fuji is a symbol of japan and um and so i could i could just count off um and i won't but there's dozens of dozens of artists that produce fuji designs during this time and it was a way to placate the government so you know the government wanted to see artists supporting the the nationalistic conversation being had by by what which was led by the government of course and so you know something like this sort of you know i think placated the 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 powers that be so it's kawanishi producing a very very nationalistic design of fuji but the 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 design is in in night, which is interesting. And Japan is known um, as the land of the rising sun, and so he could have easily added a sun instead of uh, the moon. But he added the moon, and I, I think there's also a slight subversive quality to it. It is beautiful, and it's a beautiful scene, um, and it's very muted um, for Kawanishi. No, he did some night designs, and they are more muted. It's nighttime. But in this case, this larger scale print um, is, as as a as a collector and dealer in Kawanishi, it is more uh, of an aberration from his body of work than what you expect. So I just find it interesting that this was done in 1940, um, and it's part of that conversation, and it's part of that tradition of producing design showing the divine uh, nature of the landscape. All right. I'm going to, there's plenty to see. So thank you for holding on. We will continue. Now, here is another work by Sempan. It's interesting. I'm, I'm highlighting the same artist because I'm showcasing um, different versions of how they presented images that were relating to the war. And here the, we have a beautiful landscape. Um, this reminds me almost of a Zechi. Um, this might be a mountain that a Zenchi produced or even a volcano, active volcano, because you kind of see something coming out of it. Um, but here we have these, the, there's these two wooden structures that s certainly strike me as very... Um, reminiscent of what the military would have produced. And then there's these beach blockades here that the military would add to prevent um, enemies from landing. Um, and so it's an interesting sort of um, um, dichotomy. We, we have this beautiful landscape, but then we have, you know, the activities of, of, of man and of that particular time. Now, Senpai might have been saying that you know, we have to protect the beauty of Japan and this is set up so that we protect it. I could see that. I could certainly see that. I don't see this as a commentary um, against the war, but it definitely documents um, what you would see um, domestically for the Japanese. Now, that was done about 1940, 42. It's not dated, and, and that book is that print is not illustrated anywhere. So I really can't tell you exactly, but it's early 40s. But I want to get closer to the war now. This is an interesting pr print. Here, I'm going to move this 
to this folder so I can thank you for indulging me and help. And I, I'm just doing this by myself and I'm doing it with one hand. So I wanted to pull two prints. This, this print is by um, Shimizu Masahiro. And um, he was an artist, a Sosaku Hanga artist, who was really interested in sort of Japan's rise um, in its modern sort of quality. And so I brought out a print that is an example of his work. This was done in the late 20s, early 30s, and this shows Ginza. And this showcases these commercial balloons. They were basically advertisements for the shops. Um, and it just this just shows the rise of Japan in its sort of modern way of, 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 of in these buildings. There's the department stores. It's a beautiful design that has its connection to German expressionism and other Western artistic traditions. But in this case, I want to highlight this postcard. It's a very rare postcard. It's from it's a, the, a New Year's postcard from 1944. So this is very much in the war. And what we have here, these are these Zero Jet Fighters. And so they're called Zero. That was their nickname because they were issued or commissioned um, first by the Japanese um, uh, military in the year 2600, which was the, the imperial year for Japan, or 1940. And so the, the, both of those dates have zeros at the end. And so the, the zero stuck. And so that, that's why they're called zero jet fighters. And um, what we have here is, you know, the, there's the jets flying in formation. And then they seem to be dropping things, um, you know, assuming that might be bombs or something, artillery or I don't know. It could, I, 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 I interpret this as stuff they're dropping. And then, of course, it's a New Year's greeting. You know, this isn't something that was commissioned by the government. This is something that the artist himself decided to do. And so this is certainly something that is supportive of the war, supportive of Japan. And so I want to highlight that, you know. Again, a lot of the literature that you read about modern Japanese prints does not really discuss this period and, and sort of overlooks it. Now, it's true that prints were not produced in quantity at this time because there were shortages of materials. Um, and so that, that was certainly a problem. But they still art, print artists still produce prints. And they did produce designs that may have been controversial later. Um, but in this case, you know, this is a typical artist, um, um, uh, you know, showcasing um, Japan's military might in, in the thick of the, of the battle um, 1944. And Philip has translated the, t uh, the writing for us as fast wings for the new year. So, you know, it, it is a greeting and at the same time a rally to, you know, I think the artist was really um, sort of capturing um, part of the spirit that was already ongoing. I don't, I don't think he, w he needed to do anything other than um, participate. So, like I said, that is an example of something that was completely self-driven, not promoted by the government in any way. Now, that is the last work I want to talk about before the war. And, and then, um, well, technically, the, the next few prints I'm going to show show sort of the last days of the war. And I want to thank uh, Chris Walther. He's a, he's a great uh, collector. He's a good friend. Um, he, he has an amazing collection of uh, Sosaku Hanga. I could talk about his collection um, all day. And he was kind enough to let me borrow uh, a few prints that highlight um, probably one of the most significant um, occurrences in Japan's history. And so these two prints are by Kiyoshi Asai, and they were done in 1945 after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And they're dated here, 1945-86. That is the date of the bombing. But the, I don't think they were done the day of. You know, they're, they're commemorating what happened. They, I'm sure, were produced the same year, maybe even days after it. But they were not produced the day of. 
So I just want to point that out. In 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 someone some I was showing this to someone and, and they commented on that. And so I thought, oh, I, I'd bring that up. But uh, uh, these two are really interesting designs. They're done with this. I mean, what I find fascinating besides the 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 images themselves is the coloration, and they they read to me as a person who grew up in the eighties and in 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 like with, with early manga and Godzilla and nuclear things happening in Japan, these colors almost, if I could call them like radiated, these colors are exaggerated in ways that strike, they mimic the idea of radiation, and at least in my mind. And that's how I read them, at least. Um, but these are, this is the aftermath. I mean, this is the rubble that was left, um, you know, in Hiroshima. I mean, it, it is just... Uh, astounding that an artist, a Sosakuhanga artist, this was not commissioned. This was just self-produced. And I, I want to say that there is a chance, I, I, uh, this is one of, of six impressions, most likely. There's a 6-4. And I think that means that this is the fourth impression of the six that he made. So these were not made to, to be sold as, as, as commercial things. They were meant to, the artist produced them in, in the sort of in the spirit of Sosaku Hanga for art's sake and, and to sort of remember this horrific time about what happened. And um, yeah, these images are the images that the Japanese were, were presented through photos in the newspapers and on television. And so, one didn't need to go visit the site to see something, to see this. Um, but, you know, this artist, I'm not sure if he was there in person, but at the end of the day, he captured these very realistically. And this is this building was the building with the dome. It was a, it was a, a structure that was used for exhibitions, and now it's part of the museum complex, the, the, the Peace Museum Complex. Um, Hiroshima and so th this is what sort of remains from the blast and it's still there and, and for those of you who, who, who visit Japan um, I, I, I highly recommend to, to travel uh, and, and, and visit the, the, the site it is, it's moving and it, it won't leave you the same so I'm going to zoom in so you can really see um, the, the, the amazing detail here I mean, I could spend more time on in these because I just think they're great. But um, there's so much to see. So, um, but all of the prints, uh, these two and a few others were all loaned um, by Chris. And so this is a, a, a book um, by the same artist, Kyoshi Asai. And these are, this is an album of the Seto Inland Sea. They're all woodblock prints. But there's a particular print in here that I want to point out if I could actually find it. Here you are. This is a view, morning in Hiroshima. And this book was published a year or two after the bombing. And so, you know, now we see the structure and we see it in, in maybe if I could use this phrase, in a different light, in the light of morning. And, um, you, you know, you kind of get a sense that it is um, um, part of this, you know, rebuilding this conversation of reclaiming that structure that survived as a monument as part of now Japanese history and so um, the the way that these prints were printed you know they're, they're quite striking the way that I see this is this print was probably produced with one printing and so um, you know it's one run um, and and uh, it's 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 quite beautiful in the way that they, they were they were rendered. So I'm going to move on to the next work. There is a lot to see. This is by an artist Matsusaki, and this shows the remnants of the cathedral that was there. It was a church um, that 
uh, that was destroyed in the bombing. And there's a lot of um, famous images of this. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it was photographed so much is because the, the, there's these round inlets in the architecture that is part of the structure. But the way that it looks here, it looks like 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 I don't know like a shocked monster that's been left in the in um, you know standing. I mean you see the mouth there and the two eyes. So it, it has this interesting shocking quality. Even now, I mean you could look at it and 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 just see that. So I I think it's really a fascinating scene. Um, a lot of artists have depicted this. There's another artist, um, um, Tagawa Ken. He he. He produced mostly work um, showcasing Nagasaki. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, but anyway, what I wanted to point out uh, showing that, uh, this is that um, in these uh, Kyoshi size, we see the, the bombing uh, um, aftermath of Hiroshima. And of course, um, in this case, we're seeing um, the, the remnants of what happened with Nagasaki. And then, of course, we all know that shortly thereafter, Japan surrendered. Um, what, uh, the other uh, work that uh, Chris loaned me, which is a really interesting um, Sosaku Hanga magazine, this is dated 1952. And, and so I just want to show one work uh, that I think is interesting. We have a black and white design done in that sort of um, really German expressionist um, style that you see a lot of artists working in. And you see overhead here, there's these airplanes overhead, and then there's these explosions in the background. And then you see these figures, there's children sort of running. There's two that are just um, laying in the field. And then this mother trying to grab onto her child and, and or two of her children, and there's another figure running. And so, obviously, this shows the mayhem of the bombings that were occurring throughout Japan, in particular Tokyo. So I, I wanted to, to show this, and thanks again, Chris, for, for sending these um, really wonderful uh, uh, designs to, to showcase. Now, um, now we're going to get into sort of major work. Um, and I, I, one of the artists that I think... Um, I, I, if, if you've heard my talks before, I know you've, you've heard me speak about Onchi. And this design is one of Onchi's masterpieces. It's, it was actually produced before uh, the, well, it was, it's considered a pre-war design as opposed to a post-war, but it was done in 1943. So it was certainly part of the conversation of the Dark Valley. And this was a portrait of a poet. His name was Hagiwara. And he was a surrealist poet that Onchi was good friends with. They were friends at this point for over 20 years. And Onchi had illustrated several of his books. Um, one in particular, Howling at the Moon. Onchi, Tanaka, and Fujimori contributed designs in, in his... Um, in his book, it's a in that that book, it's considered a surrealist masterpiece in literature, and so um, Hagiwara really, well, he was a, he was an alcoholic and he drank himself to death, and it was really in conjunction with his depression, um, and that depression, many say, it was caused by the the strictness of the government, and 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 and, and so they were really. Um, infringing upon the rights of individuals, particularly artists. Um, and I think the artists felt the most um, of that. And, you know, he, he was around for, the, for that Taisho liberalism. You know, he, he was writing, he was celebrated uh, by so many of the poets and, and, and authors of the time, as well as artists. Um, um, and so, you know, all of these, all of these literary artistic figures really um, enjoyed th this, this period before the Dark Valley occurred. And so at this point in time, you know, he, he passed away. He, he drank himself to death. And Onshi produced this as uh, a sort of a, a memorial for him. It was po done posthumously. And this design became sort of the banner of the Sosaku Hanga movement in, in many ways. 
And um, it, it was done before the war, but this impression, along with a, you know, basically a dozen, were produced after the war when the Americans and other Western um, soldiers and the Western powers uh, occupied Japan after the war. You know, uh, the United States, along with the Allied forces, really decimated large swaths of the Japanese uh, landscape in, in, in cities. And J Tokyo was really, had to be rebuilt. It was destroyed. Most of it was destroyed. And so the Americans came in, um, along with the Western, other Allied uh, forces, helped Japan rewrite their constitution or write the constitution. And, and then also, you know, rebuild the city. And, and so when they were there, and there were all kinds of people there. It was just military people. There were, you know, people. There were contractors and other. They were building buildings back up. They were doing all kinds of things. Engineers, you name it. There, there were people there. And at the time, these Westerners were really fascinated by Japanese prints, and in particular, Sosaku Hanga. And so, you know, th we've been talking thus far about these two tracks the Shinhanga movement and the Sosakuhanga movement. And basically during the war, I think they went down sort of the similar paths. And that, now, of course, the Sosakuhanga artists were more, li more likely than not to connect to things on a very individualistic basis. And Onchi produced... I don't think he ever really produced a design that celebrated the war, but, in, but he did go on a... Um, on a, on a government-sanctioned trip to Manchuria, and he produced photography. But it, was, it didn't seem to connect in any way to what was happening. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it doesn't matter because in, in my point, or my sort of thesis of this whole talk, is that at, what, at, the, at the point when the war was over, Shinhanga basically continued um, business as usual. So the artists went back to produce work that they've been doing. And, um, you know, Shinsui, Hasui, uh, Yoshida all produced designs, you know, after the, after the war was over and they sold well. However, a lot of collectors, curators, dealers look at post-war designs, particularly Shinhanga post-war designs, and they, and they find them a little less inspired. Um, you know, Shinsui's designs from pre-war era are, and particularly the pre-earthquake era, and we could talk about that another day, um, are much more inspired and much more, they have much more of an artistry that people connect to than his post-war designs. Now, there are exceptions. Of course, there's some masterpieces done by all of these artists after the war. But generally speaking, connoisseurs put a line in the sand they draw a line and say, well, I want to focus on pre-war designs because they're, they're stronger designs. And that is a criticism on Shinhanga, but it is not a criticism that you can levy on Sosaku Hanga. And in fact, what I would like to convey to all of you is that it was after the war where the Shinhanga movement blossomed. And some of the most important Japanese prints produced happened after the war. Um, and, I mean, it was in direct consequence to the Westerners being in Japan and being able to buy this artwork and promote these artists as commercial artists, the artists were able to sell things for the first time. And Onchi, though he had a, a you know, his, his, the way he had money, he had family money, number one, but two, he was a su successful book designer. He was sort of a graphic artist before that term existed. He did all kinds of graphic art, did the covers for musical uh, scores, and he did all kinds of things. But after the war, he was able to focus on printmaking in a much more serious uh, way and produced his best work. And so I want to highlight that, and I want to talk about you know, what, what happened with these artists. But in this case, this design happened before the war. And, but it, it's interesting because after the war, it really uh, sort of encapsulated the experience of the Japanese. There was so much pain and suffering that they went through. And the Americans 
connected it in another way. It's interesting. The, the Americans and, Japan, and the Japanese were at war for years. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. But at the same time, at the end of the war, both sides seemed, th th those things didn't seem to matter. And these Japanese artists were connecting in a very meaningful way to these collectors that were Westerners. And the Western collectors didn't see this as just like a Japanese man. They, they, they connected this to the emotions produced by the artist. And so these prints transcend just the design. You know, they're not, they're not just a design like a Koetsu showcases Nico. You know, this showcases the, 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 the plight of humanity in some ways. It reads, in my opinion, like a Rembrandt. And we, we forget necessarily who the figure is, and we put ourselves in, 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 in the place of this figure and kind of experience um, the, the emotional trauma that the artist and the figure must have gone through in this period. And so I think this is one of the reasons why Onchi's work was so popular, because it transcended just what the idea of what a Japanese print is, and it moved towards just great art that connected a human being to another, especially through emotion. And that's what Onchi was so successful at, conveying emotion, and in some cases, raw emotion. Now, I want to zoom in on this print just to, to show how powerful this design is in, in the way that he printed it. You almost kind of see this like sweat that is almost like blood pooling. It is so emotionally charged. Now, uh, this print was so successful that, you know, I, I'll just say this. We won't, we don't, I, I've done videos on this particular print, so I won't go through all of them, but in, they're in these, like, glassine papers, so I won't even take them out. But Sakino produced 50 impressions after Onchi tired of producing uh, this design because Onchi didn't like to redo things. And then Harai produced... Uh, another 50 after Onchi died. Uh, and then Onchi's son in the 80s produced an edition of 10 that mostly went to institutions. And if you're interested in seeing the comparison uh, to these, I talked, I talked about these prints in my seminar um, on Onchi. I think it was called Linked Verse. So, you know, uh, if you go to my website, you'll see a link to that seminar and we, you could learn all about these prints. But I just wanted to point out that this is such an important design that was a pre-war design, but really took traction in, in the post-war era. Now, this work was fully conceived because of the war. And this print depicts a, a, an amazing violinist, Sua, and, and she um, traveled Japan, uh, all throughout Japan, performing classical music. Um, and in this particular uh, case, Onchi was invited to a military installment, so somewhere in Tokyo that, you know, that was, it was the headquarters of, uh, of something. It was probably uh, a section of the military that was in charge of cultural affairs of, of some kind. And um, I think William Harnett was in charge of, of that area. And um, William Harnett was um, one of the first patrons uh, that came to Onchi to buy work from him. And he was one of the first really serious collectors of Sosaku Hanga. And so Onchi um, was invited either there by William Harnett or Oliver Statler. And he, he, he traveled there and basically Sua performed a concert for diplomats, digni uh, you know, and all kinds of people that were there. And Bononchi was in attendance, you know, mostly dignitaries, I think. But but that day, he was there and he watched this performance. And he he basically um, th this was in his notebooks. It was published by Statler, and he basically found the music so sad that you know he was hearing this really sad. Um, violin um, play in, in a place of an, you know, by a force that occupied his country. 
And it wasn't necessarily um, a criticism about it. It was just, he was just really interested in showcasing the melancholy and the emotional experience um, for him as a Japanese in a, in, in a room full of dignitaries after a war um, that caused so much suffering. And so this design is a, another Onchi masterpiece. This was directly re, um, connecting to what was happening um, in real time for the artist. So this is dated 1946. This impression is one of the earliest known impressions. Um, and, and I've talked about this print in other videos, Woodblock Wednesday, as well as my other Onchi videos. And so if, you, if you're interested in learning more about this print, um, I encourage you to watch those videos. But for today's conversation, I just want to highlight the fact that this is definitely a design that was that was inspired by the the historical uh, occurrences of the day, and this is an artist reacting to his own experience of it. It is not something that was you know sanctioned by the government. He wasn't hired by a publisher to do this. He just felt the need to do this and so you know this powerful portrait of the this this wonderful violinist um you know is a direct result of this experience and it's one of my most favorite uh portraits uh by Onchi. and and i just think the printing on the face is so superb it almost has kind of a ghostly quality to it and um and the the design here is so striking the these Two sort of black outlines can be read can be read as either figures standing there in front of Onchi, but the the also they also sort of echo the shape of the violin, just you know as if it's laying across this way. Um, you could kind of see the shape of the line, the violin there, and then these shapes are very similar to that. But it also can be read as you know music, sort of wafting through the air. You know, so it's a really interesting design. It's still representational, but it also suggests Onchi's interest in abstraction, which was certainly coming and, and very much um, a consequence of the Westerners, particularly the Americans there. There's still a lot to see. Thanks for hanging out with me. We, we still have quite a few people online. Thank you. So, um, but we'll, we'll get through this, I promise. <laughs> so this is a print of, by Onchi of an Austrian um, a soldier who was there uh, after the war. Um, his name was Ernst Hacker. And, um, and it's interesting because it's a... It's a portrait of him. You see his eye, his, his profile here. But this area here is an abstract. And this is one of those works where it's transitional. Onchi was now moving towards abstraction. And, um, and it, very shortly after this print, he, once he went into abstraction fully, he never returned to rep representational artwork. And uh, Ernst Hacker was the, one of the first collectors also he collected a lot of Onchi prints and he even participated in Onchi led groups producing prints and so you know um, I just wanted to highlight how this print is a direct um, response of what was happening and Onchi is portraying one of the people that he was coming in contact with that was connected to the allied occupation now we were just speaking of, of Ernst Hacker, and that was his portrait. And this is a complete set of the Ichimoku Shu. It's a publication produced by Onchi and the circle of artists he was working with. Um, and the group was called Ichimoku Kai, or the First Thursday Club. And this club was started... Uh, during the war, and in many reasons, many reasons why it was started, they all wanted sort of to work around Onchi. Onchi was seen as sort of the the spiritual leader of the Sosakuhanga movement. He was very charismatic, 
and, and these artists needed um, leadership. They needed sort of a, a leader that could help instill inspiration. And not just that, but in a practical way, Onchi... Onchi had money. His family had money. He was. He was. His family was part of a, of a noble class, and so, you know, the his his father was a the teacher. I think he was a, of of one of the, of the royal family. So he, he was basically his family were, were aristocrats, and he had money, and he had access to paper, and so he was able to get paper for the print artists to produce artwork, but also. Equally important, some of these artists weren't eating. You have, to, you have to understand that after the war, there was very little food. You know, one of the, 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 um, the not theories, one of the strategic um, ideas that the Allied forces had to end the war is to starve Japan, to, 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 to basically starve them until they would, would um, you know, surrender. And, and though that didn't happen, it really caused a lot of problems. Even after the war, they couldn't get enough food into the country. And so there was these artists that were coming to Onji for, for artistic inspiration and leadership, but also just practically they were hungry and they came and they ate. And so th- this is uh, an album of prints by, you know, the first one here I have is by Onchi, but I, I don't want to discuss the, the prints too much. Um, this is by Sakino. Um, there's several in here. I mean, that I could just spend the entire remaining time we have on. But I want to talk about this print. This is by Gen Yamaguchi or Yamaguchi Gen. Sorry. Uh, and Yamaguchi um, was a, one of a disciple of Onchi's. He was very much um, working um, in abstraction with Onchi very much after this. But this is a representational design. And it's interesting, um, Smith, uh, Lawrence Smith comments on this print in one of his books on the post-war period, um, which highlights this exact set. And he talks about how in this print, Yamaguchi, it's interesting, he shows a flower um, that's been cut off and blooming, but the one part of the bloom has fallen. And, you know, it, this can be a very subtle way of depicting, you know, the, what has happened to Japan. And, and, you know, the bruise of, of the war. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's reading too much into it, but I, I find it fascinating that it was a design that Yamaguchi produced that was not um, abstract, that was produced in Onchi's company. So I just thought I'd mention that. Um, and it's very much part of the conversation of what was happening after the war. And this, by chance, is a print by Ernst Hacker, and this is a print that's really inspired by Onchi. Those forms in this design are, are very Onchi-esque. And so this, to me, looks a lot like an Onchi design. And so it shows Onchi's influence on a Westerner um, who, who ended up befriending Onchi and, and working directly under him in this entire group of artists. And I just think that's fascinating. And so... You know, there is a direct communication with, with, you know, basically if you want to look at it as the enemy. These are the people that you were fighting with. But at the end of the day, when the war was over, um, those things were set aside. You know, in, in, in some ways, it doesn't really, um, for, for a lot of us in a, in a contemporary sense, that may not make sense to us. You know, uh, I won't go into politics or, 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 or what was going on in Afghanistan, but a lot of people... You know, they they still sort of harbor ill feelings after a conflict, and these artists were able to move beyond what had happened to their country, and and the Westerners were able to connect to them on a in a deeper emotional level and and be patrons, but also, you know, fellow artists. So this is a really wonderful set that showcases that that uh, connection. Now. We still have quite a few things to show, but and I'll move quickly. This is by Kitaoka, and he was one of the many artists working with Onchi, and he actually moved to Manchuria when Japan occupied it and then returned to 
um, the homeland after the war. And this album, it's a complete album that showcases his, his, his journey back to the homeland. And it was a journey that was really terrible. And uh, many people died um, in the process of returning back to uh, Japan. And, and the journey occurred mostly on foot. And it took forever. I mean, and just imagine the amount of time, you know, you'd have to put into just walking. And, and, and you're, you have a young child in this case. And the villagers are seeing the Japanese leave. And I'm sure they were harassed um, on their way out. It's not an easy experience. And so these images um, are, 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 are fascinating because they're not symbols. They're direct, um, it's a direct um, response to what Kitaoka uh, experienced through, through, through this journey. Here, here we have a figure that seems to be dead, probably, probably has passed, and a woman that's mourning, um, his loss, and you know, here's a family um, living in in this shelter for the for the the time being. Someone taking a bath outside. This is uh, Kitaoka's self portrait, um, and so I think it's really striking. You can see how young um, of a man he was. And I should also point out that Kitaoka is one of those artists that had an amazing diversity of style. I mean, you know, if you think of the, whatever artistic style that you could think of, he, he basically, you know, experimented with it. And so, you know, so these designs are done in a social realistic way. And he mentioned, um, I forget where exactly, but I think in Smith's uh, book on, on, on this set, Smith talks about this set, uh, Kitaoka mentions that he picked up this style in China uh, while he was there. He, he, he was exposed to social realism in China. And so this is a direct um, you know, response to the influence of social realism that coming in uh, um, to Japan through China. And in this design is probably the most famous one. And this is when they return to the homeland and they're, they're greeted by a man spraying them with DDT um, to remove the parasites that might be on them. I mean, this, this set is, is um, really moving. It's so tragic um, and dark. And you, you wonder, why would anyone create this set to sell is a commercial um, as a commercial enterprise, and, and the answer is he made only a few of these sets. They weren't made um, to sell as pretty things. He made this for, for why for the same reason why artists make anything for art's sake and to document his journey, the, this this very rough, difficult journey back home. Um, but. Because of that, the, the set um, and the sets out there in private hands are very important. And there are not many that are there. So I'm very fortunate to be able to show this set to you. Now, I, these are two prints by Kita Oka. These are very rare designs as well. Um, and again, you know, I want to highlight this. And I keep saying this, but I want to keep highlighting this. As a, after the war... There's these two tracks that sort of really separate. The Shinhanga movement continued the, down the path of sort of the scenes, decorative scenes of Japan. But the, the, the Sosakuhanga artists really were able to showcase their feelings and their own personal experiences as individuals through their art. And here we have these two children, basically. I'm going to move back so you could see. Um, it's a diptych. Um, you, you see this uh, separated in different, sometimes a museum book will have one print and not show the other. But I, I happen to have both. And they, they show children in, uh, in Tokyo, and then they showcase a very dark and gloomy um, Tokyo landscape. Here we have a structure whose roof has been um, blown up. Um, probably due to the fires and all of the bombings that were caused, um, or the fires caused by the bombings. And then just this landscape is just like something out of Edward Munch's scream again. It is so dark. The colors are so dark. And, and you have this, 
this little girl, and it looks like she's holding something. She's examining it. Maybe it's a morsel of food or something. I don't know. But it's a very, very dark scene, and it really highlights the what was happening in Japan right after the war. So the the Japanese were still experiencing difficulties, harsh difficulties, even after their surrender. That's not something that's really discussed um, all, very often, and it's not something we see. Um, we don't read that in in books in school, but it was it, it was it continued continued for some time. And these two designs really um, commemorate the the all of the people that died of starvation um, after the war. Now, this work is probably a new, unique impression. It's by Yamaguchi again. We saw uh, his print of the flower that had lost his uh, lost a, uh, a piece of the of of the petal. And um, this design is fascinating. And it's untitled, but it is a work done in 1948, and it showcases. You know, at this time. Yamaguchi was working solely in abstraction. But this design um, hints at realism. And so what we have here is sort of these, this island-like structure and this form that looks like an island, and there's these faces. There's this multitude of faces, and they, they're Japanese-looking faces on this island. And what we have here, if you, we back up, we see this blue silhouette that, to my eye, reads like a bomb that is um, being released and, and it, is, it is falling. And then there's this striking yellow sort of form that suggests um, the movement of the bomb and then where it might land. And this white sort of um, shape uh, lo looks to me like a shockwave of the bomb. And, and so this, this sort of echoes the narrative of what happened um, to Japan, whether it's Nagasaki or, or Hiroshima. But this showcases sort of, you know, the, 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 the horrific tale of what happened. And so, but it, it's done in a very subtle and also semi-abstracted way. I, I find this print fascinating because, again, uh, if you're a fan of Yamaguchi's, he was working completely solely in abstraction at this time. And, and it was, this is his one work that really comments on what happened. And again, you know, when you look at this design and you look at these faces, they're sort of, you know, you can make out each face, but they're, all the, they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. You can't help but feel, you know, emotions looking at this print. Um, it is really powerful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a really fantastic design. Um, and, uh, and again, highlights, you know, artistic expression by artists and their own individual way of processing the events of, of, um, of the bombings. So one, I want to show one last work or a few, a couple of few last works that highlight, again, Onchi's work. And Onchi was able to express himself fully. He, he wanted to work in abstraction at the very onset of his career. He started working in abstraction in 1915. He's actually credited with producing the first work of abstraction. And so after the war, there was an audience for his work that expressed emotion, but was also rooted in ab abstraction. Uh, the Japanese didn't really appreciate abstraction. It was, they were, the artists were producing very interesting abstracted work early on. I don't think the, 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 the Japanese were ready for it. And so Onchi wanted to be a champion for Sosaku Hanga in, in, in printmaking in general of that tradition. And so he didn't want to fight just 
just on the he didn't basically he didn't want to die on the hill of abstraction he wanted to continue his his um his battle on, on getting Sosaku Hanga recognized as a legitimate form of art, um, right alongside painting. And so he, he sort of set aside abstraction and focused on representational work. But once the Westerners won Japan, they were very much open to abstraction. And this is a, a work that actually went into the hands of another uh, U.S. military uh, person. He was actually a contractor hired by the military, um, but part of the, the, the military. And so this comes from the Cole collection. And Cole was one of those early collectors um, like Harnett and like Statler that were in Tokyo meeting with Onchi and the other artists and collecting their work. So, and this is a masterpiece. It's, it's, a, it's a monoprint. Um, it is, there's only one. And he was he produced this with paper blocks. So when you're producing uh, prints with paper, you can only print one impression, basically. So I just want to highlight in the post-war era how important these designs are, and how how different when we we think about the post-war era, how different the Sasakuhanga artists moved in in what direction, and they really went into embracing their own expression in, in, in celebrating their experiences as artists and creating amazing, unique work. And then the Shinhanga artists who continued producing artwork for the publishers. But at the end, you know, it's interesting. Sosaku Hanga dies when the contemporary art movement basically swallows the Sosaku Hanga artists because they're so successful. And they, they started their own studios and they start printing prints and and they they just they 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 move into the international print realm as opposed to Japanese prints, and the Shinhanga movement kind of died because, you know, there wasn't anywhere to go with it. Um, you know, after 1960 or so, really the prints became more about contemporary art, and not about scenes of old Japan, and so you know that's interesting to take note of. of because they both movements end basically about the '60s, uh, but in in very different for very different reasons. Uh, so I want to show these are some like masterpieces, um, but I'll I'll show this work. It's one it's one of his most celebrated designs. This is a a work of abstraction. Uh, Onchi used the blocks from his daughter's renovation of, of her home. He repurposed them, inked them, and cut them down, obviously, and then and arranged them a certain way and then inked them and printed the background. The background's f fabulous. And then the red portion of the design was, was uh, printed with Japanese charcoal. He cut the charcoal in half, inked it, and impressed it onto the paper. And so this is just a, a typical example of Onji's mastery at work particularly of this post-war era. And this is when the artist was unleashed with no um, issues with the government or anything about you know, issues with abstraction. You can't do this, you can't do that. This is the artist working at his full strength using all of his freedom. Uh, and so the, the irony of this is that this was done in 1954 and the artist died in 1955. And to my knowledge, he didn't produce a print in 1955. And his most important work, I would argue, um, was produced the year before he died. And so this is a year that, that where, they, where they still had Westerners in Japan um, occupying and helping rebuild uh, the country. And so this, art, this, this print went into the collection of one of those people that were in Japan, and um, and and I ended up acquiring it through the, uh, his family. So you know, this again, these prints are masterpieces of printmaking, and and if I think of the masterpieces of printmaking for Shinhanga, I have to think of the era. Oh, I have to think of like the pre-earthquake period prints, the Taisho era, and um, these prints. Are definitely not Taisho. So, you know, the, the, the most important Sosakuhanga designs really occurred um, 
after the war. And so I, I keep pointing that out because there is, you know, you, you talk to, to some dealers, some collectors, some, some, some other curators who focus more on Shinhanga, um, and then they, 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 they put, this is mostly, I, I encountered this with dealers mostly. They think of post-war prints as inferior to the pre-war designs where, you know, I, I just don't understand. So we're getting to the end of our conversation, but I wanted to, to, to show some prints that were, that were not part of the post-war era, but a little bit afterwards. And this work is by Chime Hamada. Hamada was one of these artists who actually saw, he, was, he saw uh, basically action in, 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 in the theater of war. And he, he saw cruelty, he saw violence, he, and he saw what people would see um, in, in a war. And after the war, um, he was left with all these terrible images. And as an artist, he tried to make sense of what he saw. Now, he's known for producing etchings and aquatints. These are not woodblock prints. And I don't have the darkest designs to show you. Some of those are, I, I, in some ways, I can't even show some of those. They're very graphic. But this is, I'm going to show two. One is kind of graphic and, and disturbing. This one is considered um, um, his, his masterpiece. And the way that I read this is more uplifting. And there's sort of a pun there because you see these figures in, encased in cubes floating uh, up in, or ascending, let's just say, in, up. And this print is titled Flight. It was done in 1958. And this is after a long reflection of what it was to be in battle, what it is to be a soldier, and, and a reflection of humanity um, in how humans, what hum, the cruelty a, a human could do to another. Um, oh, and, and so um, Hollis has asked, what are the years for Hamada's prints? He started making prints right after the war. There's some, in fact, his first artwork was, was sketches he produced in the theater of war. And he brought those back and made them into design. So you could, you could find Hamada's work um, in the 40s and, and so on. He lived to be over 100. And he was producing work, as far as I know, up until the, the 90s. And I'll show you a work from the, from the 90s. But uh, this case, in this design, it's from the late 50s. And so we have these figures encased in, in, in cubes, these square blocks as, and ascending. And I read the square block as almost as limiting, like the idea of a blockhead, don't be such a blockhead, and, and, and also cumbersome and weight, unnecessary weight that these figures have. But yet, they're able to transcend or overcome their block nature, which is not aerodynamic, and move up into the ether. I mean, at least I read it that way. There's other ways of reading this that is not as optimistic. Um, but I want to leave our, our conversation on a more <laughs> optimistic um, note. But at the end of the day, it is a very striking design. And I want to zoom in so you could just see the, the work here. fantastic now just got a few more prints like two more and maybe a painting this is another work by Hamada this was done in the 90s and this image it's very haunting it's of a child it looks like at least to me my eye it looks like a child and covering his ears and he's probably he keeps hearing these sounds of war and there's these warplanes overhead with helicopters with a bombed out landscape and this design is more analogous to the images uh, coming out of Vietnam than than um, than the war in Japan but at the end of the day it doesn't matter it is a continuation of the conversation that occurred in Japan during the war and and, and left artists um, interested in commuting 
communicating these things. And um, there are two works I want to discuss really quickly before we adjourn. And there are two self-portraits. Uh, if I could pull those out of this big folder. Ignore the other prints that are in here. This print was done in 1975. And it was 30 years from the end of the war. And you know, let me get my notes because there's some detailed information about this print that, um, that I want to be able to share with all of you. Yeah, I usually give these talks off the cuff, but sometimes I need notes. So this print is by Sakino. That's his self-portrait, by the way. And this print is basically his self-portrait in, um, in, in a town of, of Okinawa. Itoman is a city in Okin Okinawa. And Itoman was uh, the scene of a really horrific um, experience for, for, for a group of people. Uh, in particular, there were, there were these uh, students who, there were 222 high school students that were female who became part of a nurse brigade for the Japanese soldiers. And there were 18 teachers, and all of these people perished um, from their, this experience. Um, they either perished from the, the bombings, the gas that the, the Allied forces used on the, the people of the island, as well as uh, the remaining students committed suicide upon learning of Japan's surrender. Um, and so... You know, the, it was just a terrible experience for for the people of the island and for these students. And I won't go into particulars, but Sakino has positioned himself in this in this very dark landscape with with this skull and a gas mask, and then the, this tubular thing that probably goes into the gas mask, and and then uh, that looks like scissors or, or something like an instrument for for a nurse or a doctor and then soldiers' boots. It's a very dark um, design, and it is Sakino reflecting upon the war and his experience uh, as, as a Japanese person living in Tokyo during the war. And, you know, I wanted to showcase this, but the last work I want to show is actually not a print. Here, I'm going my hallway. It's a, it's a painting. And this work is by Sakino. It's a self-portrait oil on wood panel and it's dated 1945 and basically this this painting was done only days after uh the war was over and it was his portrait i mean he, i think the artist was thinking okay we just we just came out of this you know and and i survived and you have to understand tokyo was being bombed and then of course the the atomic bomb is at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese had no idea what was going to happen to them and what the Allied forces were going to do. And so imagine right after the war, when Japan surrenders, this feeling of, well, I survived. I got, out, I got through it. And so this, this painting really celebrates that fact. It celebrates um, the, the, um, his ability to survive as a human and as an artist. And he, he's celebrating his artistry in this painting. So anyway, I, we, we, we saw a whole lot. Here, I'm going to come over on this side. We saw a whole lot. So I'm going to open up uh, the, the floor to questions um, and be mindful that we've been having a conversation for the last hour plus and my phone apparently needs to uh, get a, a little bit more battery life to it but i can answer a few questions if people have questions so uh please well while i'm waiting for questions if any questions surface you know i want to thank all of you for for joining me uh and you know what i really wanted to highlight is is the artistry of uh, the Japanese artists produce, uh, produce, producing amazing prints throughout the war years, the dark valley years, the war years, and after the war, and, and how artists could make sense of, of all of these really horrific experiences and be able to use their talents to convey 
their own personal experiences, advance their own experiences, and as well as sort of share things with the world so that perhaps some of those things never happen again. And, and so, you know, I, I think this area of Japanese art is certainly overlooked. And, um, you know, I thought, well, why not produce such a, um, a topic uh, that is overlooked, and especially now with, with the world being in, it looks like it's in, in a little bit in, in chaos in certain areas of the world. And so, you know, looking back, reflecting on these things that have occurred really, you know, can help all of us. And so it's been my absolute pleasure to present all of these uh, prints and uh, painting to you. Um, and... Um, I want to thank all of you for joining me. It doesn't look like any has, anyone has any questions. So again, thank you. And if, you, uh, if any questions occur to you uh, later on, feel free to post them um, below in the comments and I will be happy to field those questions. So thank you again. Um, feel free to, to join my email list to learn more about our offerings on our website as well as future seminars like this. Thank you, Elias Martin from Collecting Prints or CollectingJapanesePrints.com. Thanking all of you for joining me. See you next time. Bye.